All right, everybody, I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon and The Blackest Heart, both published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today, I'm going to be reviewing The Shadow of the Torturer by Gene Wolfe. This is the first book in his series called The Book of the New Sun. And I've got the others here, book two, three, and four. And I love them. You know, I just now, so anyway, before I had these four books, I had these two um, omnibus editions. So book one and two were in this one, book two, three and four were in this one. And I just had these kind of paperback omnibus editions of the, of the four book series compiled in two books. But then I saw on eBay, someone was selling first edition hardcovers for pretty cheap. So I bought them all, and I'm glad I did, because one of the reasons I'm glad I did is I love these Don Mates covers, and I wanted to get each Don Mates cover, because we always review the covers on my channel. And this Don Mates cover of The Shadow of the Torturer is one of my favorite book covers of all time. Don Mates was one of the great fantasy and science fiction illustrators of the 1970s and 80s and 90s. And this thing is gorgeous. I, I One day I will do my top 10 book covers that I love of all time. Because you know I love illustration and graphic design. And when I do that top 10, I guarantee you this is going to fall within that top 10 because I just think that's such a gorgeous cover. I love everything about it. Just everything about that is so great. That's our torturer, Severin, our main guy with his sword there. His sword named Terminus Est. So what's this about? It came out in 1980, folks. This was one of the precursors to the Grim Dark movement. This would be sort of your grandfather of Grim Dark books. I mean, this is this book is thin on plot, like the name of the wind. It's thin on plot, but it's beautifully written and very engaging. And when I say thin on plot, what I'm talking about is told in the first person, just kind of like a Name of the Wind or something like that you might be familiar with. And it's um, not fast-paced. It's not like a thriller. It's not like a, it's not like a thriller movie where everything's just fast-paced. It's more of an introspective look at a torturer's apprentice. That's what Severin is. He's a torturer's apprentice. And there's torture. I, I'm not trying to tell you there's not action and adventure because there is. There's torture scenes. There's blood and guts. It's very grim, very gritty, very dark. There's sword fights. There's dis there's adventure and stuff like that. But it's dialed back. And when I mean dialed back, is the writing is so good. It's like you you read so you read the the writing is so good. You read it so slowly that it's just. Because you're just drinking in how awesome of a writer Gene Wolfe is, and I'm not making this up. Everybody throughout the history of time will tell you that Gene Wolfe is sort of like the literary master of the fantasy genre. And that these books are sort of his magnum opus. And they're very, very good. Now, keeping in mind, you need to be in the mood to read these things because the word choices, the sentence structures, is very Cormac McCarthy-esque. Very literary, very dripping just with uh, all the literary trappings you could want. Full of allegory. And it's about a torturer. A torturer's apprentice. It's a coming-of-age tale. This first book is a coming-of-age tale. Now, it takes place in a post-apocalyptic Earth. In fact, they call this place Earth. But they spell it U-R-T-H. And it's much like the sort of Shannara, uh, the Shannara books would take place in a post-apocalyptic Earth, where sort of things have sort of digressed to a middle age, to the Middle Ages, and in sword and sorcery and stuff like that. It's very medieval times. That's what we're dealing with here: post-apocalyptic things that have sort of digressed to medieval times. And we've got these guys, these torturers, and Severin, our main man, is one of the torturers. He's an apprentice. And it's told through his eyes, and he makes he makes the mis one mistake that a torturer can't have, and that is he he sympathizes with other people and other creatures, and he's got compassion. And if you're a torturer, you just can't have that. And he's got his sword here, terminus est, and his torturer's cloak. Well, anyway, he 
the first thing that he shows compassion towards is a dog. And he, and he, he, he gains, he gets um, really attached to this dog and the dog gets injured, right? And it really affects him because he's, he's like, I know I shouldn't feel bad for this animal. I'm, I'm supposed to be tough, a torturer. I gotta, I can't be tough. I gotta be stoic and, and unfeeling and, and nobody can see my emotions. But people can tell that, 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 that his dog has been injured and it's really affecting him. And there's a scene here that I love the way that this is written, where he's talking to one of the other apprentice torturers, and the, and, and the person's talking to him about the dog. Valeria smiled. You see, you have found some comfort here. You are worried about your poor dog because he is lame. But he too may have found hospitality. You love him, so another may love him. You love him, so you may love another. Severin agreed, but secretly, though he would knew he would never have another dog, which proved true. I like that, I like that passage because it reminds me of the dog I had when I was in, a young boy. My dog's name was Popeye. And he was a Norwegian elk hound, and he, I loved him, to, I loved him, and he would just, he, Norwegian elk hounds are bred to hunt elk. They're bred to run through the mountains and hunt elk. But he was tied up, you know, we had to keep him tied up. Otherwise, he would run through the farm fields and kill the farmer's sheep, which he did every time he got away. And we tried to keep him tied up, but he was an escape artist, and he got away. And he was shot by the sheep farmer, right, and killed. And, uh, and I was devastated. And my, and my parents kept telling me, you'll have another dog, you'll have another dog that you'll love just as much. And I said, no, I will never have one, another dog. That's the only dog I'll ever have. Popeye, he's it. I don't want another dog. Popeye's my dog, even though he's dead. And it proved true. Just like in The Shadow of the Torturer, that final line where Severin thinks, I'll never love another dog. And it proved true. I said the same thing to my parents. I will never love another dog. And it's proved true. I, I just I have no interest in any other dogs other than Popeye. If he could come back, maybe there's a pet cemetery somewhere and I can get, get my Popeye back. We'll have to talk to Stephen King about that. He should, Stephen King should write a story about like that kind of a thing. I bet it would be wildly popular. Like a pet cemetery where your loving dogs come back to life. Anyway, let's get back to Shadow of the Torturer. Post-apocalyptic Earth. We've got this guy Severin. He's, he's, he's a, a torturer's apprentice. And he has compassion on the dog. Which leads to him having compassion on someone he's supposed to torture. And he gets kicked out of the Torturer's Guild. They're like, get out, you pansy. And so he takes his sword, Terminus Est, and his cloak. And he goes, and that's where the story kind of really starts, is our guy Severin goes out into the wilds of Earth, and he, that's, and he has all these adventures through all these other books as the torturer's apprentice who couldn't be a torturer. And um, that's a great, I mean, he, that's where the story really starts, is he's just, like when I say it's plot thin, I basically explain the plot. He's just a wandering guy. He's like Cain wandering the earth. He was a kung fu master Cain. You know what I'm saying? He just he just wanders from one thing to the next. And we get to explore his world through his eyes as he comes across different clans, different peoples, different creatures, different situations that he's got to kind of work through. Uh, it's, it's a great, and not only, and like I said, the writing Everybody on the planet that's read Gene Wolfe would agree the writing is on a different level of anything else you've ever read. And so I recommend these. The Book of the New Sun series. Book one, book two, book three, book four. I recommend everybody get them. Because they're, they're, reading these can... They're almost like a life-changing experience. It's almost like okay, I'm reading... I am reading something unlike anything else out there. When you're reading this, you really are. That's the feeling you get. And you feel like you're reading from a genuine genius. Like you're reading the words of a genuine genius. 
and someone who's writing on a level just that's out of this world. That's 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 what we get when we when we when we open up a Gene Wolfe book. So I give this a solid, straight, ten out of ten. It's been a while since I've read this, and I'm telling you, I enjoyed going back into it, especially now that I got these hardcovers, these first edition hardcovers. Oh, can't wait to get to the rest and leave reviews for y'all.